Confucianism, a word so synonymous with Chinese tradition that the two have practically become reflections of each other. We consider many of the etiquette of people across China to be a product of centuries of Confucian influences, one which prioritizes the self, the family, and the society above everything else. While many are familiar with the modern China with its glass skyscrapers and industrious facade, few understand the cultural legacies by which this modern superpower has built its massive empire on. A deeper dive into modern China reveals the historical, textual, familial, and social implications of the Ru tradition behind the contemporary glamour. To understand historical China is to understand the Ru tradition. Throughout centuries of Chinese dynastical rule, the teachings of Confucius, commonly known as Ru Jia Sixiang, or the Ru tradition, have shaped the social behaviors of millions of Chinese. Perhaps the most effective conceptualization of this idea is provided in one of the four books in Da Xue, or The Great Learning, arranged by Neo-Confucian scholar Zhu Xi in the winter of 1190. The Great Learning provides guidelines on the instructions for moral self-cultivation in the most systematic manner. Most explicitly, it does so by organizing the instructions into what is known as the San Gang Ling Ba Tiao Mu, otherwise known as the Three Stages and the Eight Guidelines. The Three Stages outlines the principles of Ming Ming De, Qingmin, Zhi Yi Zhi Shan, translated as 1. Making one's bright virtue brilliant, 2. Making the people new, and 3. Coming to rest in the highest good. The Eight Guidelines puts the principles of the three stages into practice of Ge Wu, Zhi Zhi, Cheng Yi, Zheng Xin, Xiu Shen, Qi Jia, Zhi Guo, Ping Tian Xia, or Aligning Affairs, Extending Understanding, Making Intentions Genuine, Balancing the Mind, Refining One's Person, Aligning One's Household, Ordering the State, and Setting the World at Peace. These instructions establish the implicit moral and social responsibilities required to be a functioning member of Chinese society. The Great Learning ensures that in order to be a viable social and family member, one needs to cultivate him or herself by increasing one's duties to their family and the world. It is to be suggested that maintaining Chinese family values and practices comes from many power structures, not the least of which is dictated by schools, texts, government and literati-led preaching, popular religion, and state regulations. The eight stages indicate that to be morally decorated individuals, Organizing oneself and their family are the centerpieces for world peace. As the text indicates, when a single family is humane, humanity arises throughout the state. When a single family practices deference, deference arises throughout the state. Throughout history, the traditional Confucian family dynamic has played equally into family cohesion as it has to wars and conflicts. As said in an old Chinese proverb, fen jiu bi he, he jiu bi fen. And just as families can come together in times of peace, the dynamic can also be disrupted by times of hostility. All ideas contrary to Mao's thinking and the objects that represented them had to be destroyed. Not just Confucianism and Buddhism, but even more so foreign faiths like Christianity. It is hard to imagine that only 45 years ago, the integral Chinese values of family and society were almost categorically destroyed by internal strife. The driving factor behind these tribulations is the relationship between Ru tradition and modernity, one which has fueled debate in China and grew out of the May 4th movement. In 1919, Students from several universities gathered outside the Gate of Heavenly Peace in Beijing to reject Confucian traditions, which were seen to profoundly weaken the country's continued modernity and development. This single consequential event had profound lasting impacts, which shaped decades of Chinese policy. 
Ultimately, these anti-traditionalist sentiments continue to drive spirits of national upheaval leading into the revolution of 1966 and continues even until today. However, perhaps it is best to analyze exactly what we must define as modern. In a society which has been dominated by Western ideals for the greater part of two centuries, is the idea of modernity simply when a country or culture is in alignment with Western conceptions of decorum? Certainly the motivations of the May 4th movement were driven by a need to establish a sense of Chinese modernity against the backdrop of Western imperialism. Confucian traditions have seen many threats to its continued existence, but what holds it together still lies in its values. The last step of the Great Learning emphasized Ping Tianxia, or setting the world at peace, something which has been built into the Chinese psyche. China has been through some of the darkest times in the last century, and it is ultimately the determination of the Chinese people that holds the nation together. Consequently, the Confucian values of societal harmony and peace establish the virtuous goals to maintain. It should be said that in order to make a documentary regarding modernity and Confucianism, one simply cannot ignore the impact Neo-Confucianism has had on Chinese society. In its most basic form, Song Ming Li Xue, or Neo-Confucianism, took shape in the Tang Dynasty and emphasized a Confucian revival of old traditions. In tandem with the Ru revival, there were also adaptations of Taoism and Buddhism intertwined in the already glamorized version of Chinese thought. To many, such an ideology may seem similar to those implemented during the Enlightenment period of 17th and 18th century Europe. However, Neo-Confucianism made no attempt to dismantle the very belief system Confucianism had instilled in people, rather to rejuvenate, simplify, and emphasize key teachings in the already existent traditions. On the contrary, the Enlightenment introduced intellectuals such as Voltaire, who actively tried to systematically disengage the masses from the Catholic Church through his advocacy for the separation of church and state. Many consider the role of Confucius in modern China to more or less be similar to that of a historical model, without any real substance. However, could it be that his old ideas have simply been adapted to modern forms? Modern China has seen Confucianism take a new direction one away from the ritual propriety of the past, instead forming a state institutionalized value system. A famous Chinese proverb from Mencius, known by many, is the phrase liang zhi liang neng. Liang zhi is the ability to know without thinking, and liang neng is the ability to do without learning. While most Chinese can no longer recite the Analects word for word, it is proverbs like these that show just how ingrained the root tradition is in Chinese society. It is precisely liang zhi that allows people to continue thinking about Confucianism, and liang neng that allows them to continue learning about it. China has changed, learned, adapted. The way modern China has established itself as a modern superpower of the 21st century could not have been done without the strong Confucian virtues of family and society. Similarly, it could not have been done without letting some of those traditions go. Over the centuries of change and adaptation in China, many have posed real threats to the continuation of the Ru tradition. If we look at how tradition has impacted Chinese society today, it is easy to point and look to say problems of poverty, classism, and famine exist due to our continued longing for the past. While such arguments are not without merit, precisely, it may be just our longing for the past that allows us to move into the future. Hi, 
Thanks for watching. A few quick points before I end the video. First, this video is a final project from an Asian Studies 332 class Confucianism in Modern China and Beyond Reinventions of Tradition at the University of British Columbia Department of Asian Studies, and as you might have guessed, the scholarly parole isn't actually an online publication. Second, I know that many will say that I have mistranslated the term Ru Jia Sixiang as Ru Tradition when it should have been more described as Ru Thought. But just bear in mind that the term Ru is an all-encompassing term that describes Confucianism, but is not limited to the linguistic ambiguities of Ru Jia, Ru Jiao, and Ru Xue, as illustrated by Yong Chen in his article Problems and Ambiguities Surrounding the Question of Confucian Religiosity, which I have linked in the description. Lastly, it may seem that I use the term Ru Tradition and Confucian Tradition interchangeably in this video. While the two certainly have similar attributes, for the sake of simplicity, just know that whenever I am referring to the Confucian tradition, I am talking about the Chinese tradition as described at the beginning of this documentary, while the Ru tradition is instead the values and belief systems taught by Confucius himself.